my, my name is Tim Bobaiko. I <laughs> my dad was a soldier and then was a teacher, became a soldier, became a teacher again. We we lived in several places from Imo. Uh, uh, we lived in that Bacha in Olu Road uh, back in the days, just slightly after the Civil War. Uh, I was born in Kaduna, grew up in Kaduna. Unlike uh, I've said several, I was born into this very, very poor and modest home. Uh, I think I was read, I, I just started writing my memoirs and I, I, I said in, in that memoir, I think I was 10 years old when I finally realized that Lord Jesus, we're poor, we're, we're, we're little, little poor people, you know, because I, I just then it began to, to occur to me and I began to, I began to understood why I couldn't afford most of the things that some of my mates had when I was growing up. Well, you see, the thing is, that, that same thing, instead of uh, breaking me, gave me a lot of courage, and, you know, because I just felt that, look, you know, there's two options before me. See that I'm going to live in this hole and die, and then that will be the end of my story, or I can pick up myself from by my bootstrap and try and do something positive without going into crime or any other thing. I just do an honest man's job and try and work my way up. I feel very fortunate that I chose the right path. I have no regret at all, you know, and I, and I feel uh, I got the opportunity to go to Federal School of Arts and Science later. I, I, I did my A-levels there. From there, I went to Abadubilo University, Zaria, where I studied theater arts and I graduated on top of my class for my graduating year. I um, did my NYC and then came to, started, came to Lagos, was well, June 8, 1995, when I landed in this town, packed my bag from Kaduna, because I just felt, look, I've done enough. If I really want to, to, to practice advertising, the only place I can practice advertising in Nigeria is Lagos. All the major advertising are here, all the major clients are here. So I woke up. June 8, 1995, and I said, this sun that has risen in Kaduna will not set in Kaduna and make me here. And there I was. And until I got to Ojota, I wasn't even sure where I was going to live. I ended up spending two years squatting with a chef at what is called Golden Tulip uh, Lagos. Now it used to be called Dover Hotel, <laughs> Mile 2. So when I, I was there, still squatting for the first two months when I got my first job. So every morning now, I, I, I normally would walk from <laughs> my to uh, Dover Hotel. That is a more word of here. I walk to my two. That's that's quite some distance. I get there. I will take Molu and going to Oshodi. <laughs> I'll I'll drop at Oshodi. Then I'll take a bus <laughs> going from Oshodi to Ikeja. Then I'll drop at uh, Nigel bus stop, crossover, and then I will walk to Oshodi Fire State. And that was my. That was my that was my life for two years. You know, it was a very tough period. I had to wake up very early in the morning. I'm usually one of the first people to get to the office. I'm usually one of the last. And people used to say, "Oh, this this boy is so hardworking." No, because I know if I get back, the guy I was partying with would probably still not be home. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no point going to wait for him. Let me just people stay in the office and just get my job done. So, why well, it was it was beautiful. I really don't miss those days, but also I miss it sometimes, just seeing you struggle. And then I, I was able to get money together after two years, rented my first uh, apart, apartment at uh, Irewode Avenue off of Pebby. Stayed there for another six, seven years, you know. I, I, and, I've been, and I've been doing it, I've been doing so much, putting in work, and now like Drake would say, we came from the bottom, now we're here. <laughs> it's not like we are rich or anything, but at least we're, we're making progress and we're working progress and we're moving on. So if there's any young person watching, just know that the most admired men or, 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 or women that you know out there that you really love and admire so much, they have a story similar to this, sometimes even worse, you see. And whatever it is you're going through today, Keep your head together, keep your head up, be proud of yourself. It's going to be a painful process, but it's better to bear the pain today and enjoy tomorrow. Crime looks like a shortcut, but trust me, the long arm of the law will find you, so you really don't want to go there. Keep yourself together. And I mean, the thing is that wherever advertising goes, I mean, uh, you have to be able to channel your ideas to, to make 
to fit that new platform. And let's not forget, most of the things you hear is that, oh, new media has come to kill traditional media. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen, okay? Maybe budget can shift in terms of which, you know, maybe let's give new media more priority. And let's not even forget that the new media of 2020 is the old media of 2025, okay? Because media will, media will continue to evolve and media will continue to come and go. Uh, when TV started, the, the, when, when TV started, it said that was the end of radio. Radio is still here side by side with TV. How many hundreds of years later? So it's, it's, it's going to be the same thing. The only thing that's going to reign supreme and endure till this world comes to an end will be the creativity of human beings. Because media will come, media will come, media will go. Our ability to create and come up with powerful ideas is what is going to endure. Okay, then tell us the new innovation in the advertising industry. There are a lot of people who know about. And as an expert, tell us. Well, there, there are lots of new, there are lots of innovation happening. The thing is that, like, I travel, I travel for most of these conf conferences, I travel for some of these tech conferences. What you find out today is that engineering and tech is playing such a major role in advertising and you say what is the relationship between creativity and science you see if creativity is able to get here on, on its own normally with engineering and tech it will get to the sky you know so tech and engineering is the new wings that creativity is utilizing to fly even higher and deliver more results for our clients so if you are if you run an agency today don't be surprised that you are hiring a chief technology officer because you need to be able to understand the power of modern text that's out there that you can use and plug your creativity into that will boost and amplify the messages you see all of the whole new platforms are coming up every day from TikTok to to instagram to all the other platforms these are tech-based platforms that if you are able to utilize very well and know what to do to amplify your messages on this platform, you can create more reach. So, and like this meeting, for instance, I don't, I don't think that between the AAA and the online journalists, there's ever been a meeting. So, but we're meeting now. It's a first step, first step in the right direction. That's how we intend to meet with everybody, including people in the tech space, including people in media space. Everybody, let's come together. There must be meeting of mind and constant rubbing of minds for us to be able to uh, create a a mutually beneficial relationship between uh, your sector and any other sector and advertising. So it's one step at a time. But the, the, for the consumer is that they don't even have to, it's, I think it's convenience. That's what the advantage is going to be for consumer uh, and, and democratization of information. Before, you see that you have to turn to a program on TV before you can get the message from the, from the client. Uh, or you have to read a newspaper or you can still do all of those things but today we can for the consumer because of the preponderance of tech and how tech has really changed our world you can be holding your phone and we can locate you there's something they call geolocation ads so it means that if you if you tweet if you are standing by somewhere in the dweller bar you just tweet to say ah you see people do it all, a lot of the time. I'm craving, I'm craving burger. It means that if I'm a burger seller, seller I can use geolocation to, to locate that person who is craving burger in Ujueleba by 2.30 p.m. on a Friday afternoon and I'll hit him or her with a message to say, go to our joint, not too far from Ujueleba, we sell the best burgers there. So that's that's convenience. So it means you don't have to look out for those messages, for those messages to hit you. So you have, the consumer today is more informed. Back in the days, you can do a piece of advertising. But because you have people who are reviewing your product, as your product comes out, there are lots of people reviewing it and putting it on YouTube. So there's information. So before consumers buy anything now, they've done peer review. And they do they, so you can't even fool the consumer today. So they are more informed, and there's so much confidence. It's, it's, it's great content for TV. I think it's fantastic content for TV. And if you look at, if you look at the, just not even 
let's pause on the content for for a second and look at the economics behind the program. Nigerians have, have, have been employed in these very difficult times. Hundreds of millions of of naira is gone into setting up that house. Will use diesel that is from Nigeria. It will hire security there. It will hire health officials to manage the COVID, uh, you know, social distancing uh, okay. parameters. There are people who are going to come out there and become real celebrities and be able to empower, get empowered. If we look at the finance behind this, it's, it's amazing how much uh, Monstress has put uh, behind that program. So, I mean, this is a company that's giving a lot back to, to Nigeria. So, I, I really don't understand what, what the controversy is. I mean, it's not... If you look at some of the challenges facing this country today, you will agree with me that the least of them is BB Niger. So really, if, if I really want to speak, I'd rather speak to some of the big challenges facing us that we need to address as a, as a people. And just let uh, young people have enjoy themselves and, and teach whatever lessons they want to teach each other. You know? uh, but unfortunately, for the past five years, due to government dissolving all of the uh, the, the, uh, uh, the all of those some of those councils, the Apple Council has not been functional for the past five years, and that's why we're calling again. I'll use this opportunity to call on the government, please. We are putting an entire industry in jeopardy by still refusing to constitute the council. I had the opportunity of meeting with the Minister for Information, the Honourable Minister for Information, uh, Lajilai Mohamed, in March, I think 4th of March this year, before the lockdown started. And the good man gave his word and promised that he was going to do his best to make sure that Apcon is reconstituted as soon as possible. So we're still looking forward and hoping that that happens very soon, and I believe him, and I do believe that he's, he did try his best to make sure that we resolve it, but we need to resolve it because people who now claim things that are not factual, not right, are getting away with more than now because APCON is not fully constituted. We need to be able to constitute the council so that the APCON can regulate and do its job. To be honest, if you look at the music industry today, it's, it's a troubled industry. Look at, <laughs> look at how COVID-19 has affected the industry and uh, people are not even able to perform. So for us, it's just, I think for me, I'm trying to see what we can do regarding the business model of music itself. How, because see, you don't want to sign, we don't believe in just signing an artist for signing sake. If you sign an artist, it takes a lot of money to break an artist. So when I'm walking by the road and so mother comes to meet me, oh please my son says come and sign him. You are just, you are just telling me to take on responsibility of maybe 100 to 150 million to spend on your child, for, his, for your child to become, uh, to, yeah, you know what I mean. So it's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's, it's a responsibility you take with all seriousness. So we're looking at it, uh, but we're really, really proud of Simi, we're proud of what she's doing. That this is his amazing, amazing work. We're proud of the work she's doing, and uh, we'll still continue to find ways to support young talent because that's what we've done. So in how is any industry, except if you are selling hand sanitizer now, that's the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> or you are selling, or you are selling face mask. If not, everybody is affected. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it has affected people. Can gather. People need to gather first before you can play music. People need to uh, gather to, for you to be able to have experiential advertising experience, you know. Uh, so all of those things have been uh, affected one way or another. Uh, and we're hoping that this pandemic will, will, will blow over soon so that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Fantastic, you can see my plaque here. That's the plaque for Madrid. Uh, represent uh, as one of the global creative leaders, top 100 creatives in the world, 2019. I, uh, like I said, I, I really don't know anybody in New York. I don't know anybody in Adric. I was just driving home one day and I checked my email and I saw an email from Adric. I'm like, oh wow, this is amazing. And it just tells, for me, it's a story that can help motivate other people out there to say, if you're doing your stuff, there's no hiding place in this world. If it's, a, if it's good and if it's positive, 
trust me, the world is watching and you will surely be rewarded in due course. So I'm really grateful to Andrew for that recognition. The reception in Cannes was amazing. I met with uh, fellow rep recipients from all over the world. We had champagne by the balcony, <laughs> uh, on that balcony facing the Palais. So in Cannes, it was, it was a beautiful experience. I, I felt very honored to be there. And for me, just representing Nigeria, flying the flag for Nigeria, is something of immense pride for me, yeah. It's more than my brother. I, I, come, <laughs> I come from this very poor home where I'm the firstborn. We are six in number. And he, he, as much as all my life, I always wanted to be on TV, to be a broadcaster. But when I got to MTA Academy, it, it, it didn't take long for me to understand that how you look fine on TV and how your pocket looks are two, two different things. And I realized that people look fine on TV and when they finish reading the news, they are looking for money to get Okada to go home and I'm like, I'm not going to be part of this one. <laughs> I really wanted to do a, a very honest day job where I can be well rewarded for it. And then uh, I found advertising and since then I've not looked back. I'm, I'm really happy and grateful for this advertising profession for all the great things it's so done for me. Unfortunately, I don't even have investment in, in broadcasting. If I have investment in broadcasting, which is why if I ever get any license or whatever, I would like to do it differently so that the whole world can see what, what I've done. But in my area of co co uh, competence, where my area of jurisdiction, like advertising, you can tell from this structure you, you see here, from the way we treat our people, you see that we've tried to redefine how it, what it means to put premium on your people. And there's no way you can work in extreme and say, oh, you are being old salary or it's never happened in our eight years. And those are the kind of stuff I like to see permeate the rest of our industry. Uh, but I mean, as we can only continue to be the change we want to see by acting positive and doing all the positive things and contributing. Every year you see that we, we, in, for the past eight years, we renovated school and handed it back to the state government. We've gone as far as cheaper to buy uh, desk and furniture for the school that Boko Haram burned down in Borno State in Chibo. We, we have to keep giving back to society because, I mean, this is the society that gave you the opportunity to do business in the first place. So if we wait for the government to sort all of this problem out, we're, 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 we're wasting our time and we're, we're just allowing innocent Nigerians to suffer. I mean, we'll, there are people who will have maybe more privilege to be able to, to contribute more. I think it's right for those people to come out and do a little bit. If everybody does a little bit, we find out half of our problems will, will reduce, and that's what Extreme is all about. It's just been about investing in school. We don't even invest in investing, we invest in high school, secondary school. But we just believe that that's where the building block of our life really happen at a very concrete level. So we feel that unless we contribute in that space, People will be too fully formed for us to be able to intervene and help show them where they should go to. The most, one of the most memorable days of my life was I was at the airport, I think a year ago, and I saw this very tall guy, a tall young man, taller than me, walked up to me, he yeah, Mr. Steve Obaiko of Extreme, I said, yes I am. He said, uh, I just want to thank you. When I was in secondary school by last year, you came to the face the block of classrooms for us. And I'm telling you, you don't know how much difference it made to us being able to learn. And that young guy is, was, had just uh, gotten admitted to a university abroad and was going there, probably a scholarship or whatever. But for me, it just reinforces that value system that we have as a, as a business to say we must continue to give back because unless we do that, uh, I don't think we will have fulfilled the purpose of our reason being here, you know, so, yeah. sad about what's going on in Southern Katna. I really believe that uh, the governor uh, really is aware, I mean, he's the chief security officer of the state and I'm sure he must be aware of what, what's going on and he must have a plan to, to, to sort it out. Uh, I wish him luck in, in doing that, but honestly, my heart beats for Southern Katna and uh, they're wonderful people. I grew up in Katna all my life. In fact, if you still see on my passport, 
where I was born is Katna. I still believe I'm a Katna boy. All through this pandemic, I still sent money to support uh, a group of people who were distributing uh, hand sanitizers and masks in that state. So that state is always going to be part of my life. Uh, there is nowhere, anywhere in this country where one single Nigerian dies that is not something that we should all, it's something we should all mourn. So not to talk about uh, a lot of people has been reported by the news uh, losing their lives. I really, really feel uh, we need to come together and do something. It's not until something disastrous happens in another country and then we start shouting, oh, let's pray for Lebanon, let's pray for... I mean, yes, it's tragic what's happening in those other places, but I think uh, charity begins at home. I think we should pay more attention to Southern Canada and hopefully uh, uh, our humanity will prevail to say that all the killing happened in Southern Canada should never stop. Honestly, I mean, I wish I could tell you what the root cause is, cause is but I mean, I, ju I just think we just need to tolerate each other's views. No matter where you come from, if you are Fulani or if you are an original Southern Canada as uh, indigenous, the thing that will save this world is tolerance. We need to tolerate each other. If you are a Christian, you are a Muslim, it doesn't matter. Can we just all come to the table and reason? so that peace will prevail because even if you really want to, if you're a farmer in southern Canada, if there's no peace, how are you going to farm? And if you're a cattle herder who is full of and if there's no peace, how are you going to herd your cattle? So I think it's just, it's just tolerance. We just need to toler tolerate each other's view, you know, because without tolerance, this cycle of killing and counter-killing and reprisal killing will never stop. I mean, we've seen some other areas in the world where They've been at it. If you look at Israel and Palestine, I mean, there are people who grew up who are like maybe 40 or 50 years, and the only thing they know is the violence that's been cyclical in those parts of the world. We really don't want to end up like that. So for me, I think it's just let's preach peace to each other and just tell it's not about who is at fault, it's about just being able to sit down and stop the killing and stop the bleeding, like right now. That's what we need to. Well, I mean, there are people already doing, speaking up already, people, I, I mean, I can't even be more Catholic than the Pope because, I mean, I mean, I've been born there, I have lived there and I appreciate the fact that I, I love Cardinal as a city, uh, but there are people who are originally from there who, uh, as, at least, as, at this point, it's good to just first start by and see what the real indigenous are doing. You see voices like Aldo Mekuri has been speaking up, uh, a few people too have been uh, speaking of two who are from that side, uh, you know, sadly a lot of people have lost their lives. They, 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 they've lost families have lost have been lost in the in the fracture. But uh, we will continue to see where we can uh, contribute. And like me, even speaking out now, still talking about peace and tolerance is part of the process. You know, there is no silver bullet that I know that can solve this problem that's happening in Southern Canada because it's a perennial one. Uh, but I'm hoping that common sense and tolerance will prevail so that we can find peace in that place. Okay, I mean, I, I, I just want to start by uh, appreciating everybody that's taken their hard-earned money and invested in music business in Nigeria. That's one business that I know government can never come out to claim we invested one night in this business. It's individual like myself, like Aldo Mikuri, like Kenny Ogunwe, D1, uh, if you're Moribwe, those are the people who, Obi Asika, those are the people who put their money uh, to build this industry. So, but having said that, that, that I'm really, really proud. Then you have also now talk about the second generation of music entrepreneurs who, funny enough, are musicians themselves, the Olamides of this world, the the videos of this world, the whiskeys of this world, you know, they are, they are building their own record label as well as building their own career. You had the bank of views of this world, they, they all invested, you know. Uh, but the good thing about the music is that it's going global. And we're really, really proud of what the musicians uh, are doing right now. But for me, I'd like to sound two words of, word of caution that I have, just as my two cents to just borrow uh, people. I think all of those irrelevance about who is calling themselves water, for me as far as I'm concerned, I think they are irrelevant. Let us face the business of developing this industry. So I think, especially people in the media, they, they love comparing this to that. These are young people, 
anybody you I don't even want to mention anybody's name, but anybody doing well out there, we should just be proud of the person and just be just join the supporters club of giving them a round of applause to see them become bigger. And that is the first uh, uh, caution I'd like to give. The second one would be as people and especially as we find the big names today from Bona to Davido to Whiskey uh, to Asha to Stewart Savage, all of the big names, we must be very careful so that our culture does not get hijacked by by foreigners. And it, it may not make sense what I'm saying right now is that our culture has become so so big today. If you see Beyonce doing Zanku dance, it's not because she loves Nigeria. It's all for economy. She is going to do that Zanku and she's going to make multi-million dollars. I mean, we have to protect that culture to make sure that if anybody should be making money, our people will be first in line because we are the people creating this culture. We are the people. So we, sh we shouldn't now create the culture for people to for that foreign people to come and hijack and be making money out of it. We have to be careful. This is why we need to form a lot of cooperation instead of fighting ourselves. We've, we are fighting ourselves. That people who don't know how those cultures were created will come in from the back door, take it, and then go be make, go and be making money out of it. So I think it's just let's face where the seriousness is, which is just building our culture. And continue to make our culture the, the reigning and dominant culture in the world which honestly they don't even need my advice advice they are doing that already the Beyonce has used that but now give the Nigerian guys two more months they'll come up with even maybe better dance steps than that one that uh, the next big artist wants to wants to use so I didn't, I didn't really used to like the name when I was young but I'm a proud Kogi boy I'm from Kogi State I'm from Kaba in Kogi State uh, I love my town and uh, you will most likely find me there every now and then. Uh, I have a very big farm in Kobe State now that's providing employment for lots of the young people there. You know, and uh, yeah, but uh, the name was, uh, people just, just, when they hear the name, they just didn't hear Zuma from Lagos State, but I'm not, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the name was given to my grandfather by my great grandfather. And, and since then, uh, The name is our family name. Now, my children are like the fourth generation of providers. It's amazing. See, when, when, you're doing, when you're doing things that you love, you, you don't see it as work. I mean, music advertising keeps my blood pressure high. Music brings my blood pressure down. So <laughs> I guess they complement each other somehow. <laughs> because with advertising, there's always one deadline, one client breathing down your neck to say, I want this work tomorrow. With music, you're yeah, just in the studio vibing and having fun, so yeah, for me it's always fun. Hi, my name is Simba Michael, CEO of Extreme Ideas. I was born in Kaduna, I was raised there, I grew up there, I attended Amadimino University earlier. Uh, it breaks my heart to see what's happening uh, with all of the violence happening in Kaduna. I think it's time for peace to reign. I know the governor is doing his best to bring about peace, but we need to all join hands and make sure that we pray for the city of Kaduna. It's like one of the best cities in this country. I, I, I have fond and wonderful memory of my stay in Kaduna. So it's just really, really heartbreaking to see uh, people unnecessarily losing their lives because of all the violence happening there. I think it's time for us to come together as one people, understand each other, tolerate each other, it doesn't matter whether you're Christian or Muslim, whether you're Fulani or you're from Qatar, it doesn't really matter. We are one people, we are one Nigeria, we are one people. Please let's come together and end the violence. Let peace reign in Kaduna. And please don't forget, please pray for Kaduna.